I want to say uh, good morning again and, and happy Easter. I hope you're, hope you're having a good day. I had stolen some Easter candy from my kids by 7 a.m., so my day is going pretty well uh, as far as a dad's day can go. That's the, the measure right there. Uh, and so I hope, hope you're having a good day. hope you got a cup of coffee on the way in or maybe got a chance to uh, take a picture with your family. Uh, in the photo booth, it's been said a couple times, but we want to just again say welcome to Movement Church. We are so glad that you're here, so glad that you could celebrate with us, and uh, glad that you're just here to, to hang out. Uh, we like to do something uh, every year on Easter, something that, that's kind of outside of us and, and others focus, something that uh, helps us be on mission. And so this year, uh, we want to partner with a ministry uh, that's that's near and dear to the heart of God and, and something that we, we want to have a heart for as a church. And that, that ministry is, is My Village Ministries. Uh, it's a ministry that uh, prevents unnecessary foster care placements by, by helping families in crisis. And so My Village Ministries partners with local churches, and sometimes as families are going through uh, situations or, or maybe times uh, where, where they're having trouble paying the bills or some relational things, uh, they, can, they can have their, their kids placed uh, with people from local churches and, and just ask for help. And so we've been talking about this the last couple of months. We have people from our church uh, who have actually been involved in this ministry, who, who have had active placements in their house, who have helped families and hosted children. Uh, we know that we will have more people that will do that in the future. Uh, and, and so we, we've just been asking ourselves, what can we do to, to come around these families that are in crisis? What can we do to come around the families from our church uh, that are helping these families in crisis? Uh, and, and we decided that the, the best way for us to respond to that uh, was just to be able to resource them with, with some things from Amazon. And so there's uh, there's a QR code that's uh, it's up there on the screen. Uh, I'm asking you to get your phone out, all right? So this isn't, uh, you're not going to get in trouble for it or anything. But uh, if, you, if you scan that QR code, it'll take you to an Amazon wish list. Uh, and if, if you want to just come alongside some struggling families, uh, there are things on there. Uh, there there's, there's diapers, there's, there's clothes, there's gift cards that we can give to families as they're in transition or families from our host, our churches there as they're hosting uh, some of these children. These are just some of the very practical ways that we decided that we could come alongside these families in crisis. And so we're asking you, asking us as a church, as a body, uh, to respond and uh, just buy some things on that list. If you want to buy one thing on that list, that is awesome. We are grateful. If you want to buy 20 things on that list, I salute you, all right? So whatever whatever you want to do, whatever you want to buy to help those families in crisis, uh, we just wanted to offer some way that, that we could respond and, and love people uh, as a church today. And so we are we're blessed and excited uh, that you can do that. And so if I see you on your phone the rest of this message, I will know that you are spending hundreds of dollars on Amazon and you're tracking with the message and you're really excited and, uh, and, and we'll both know that that's what's going on, all right? Awesome, awesome. Well, hey, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a father of four and I'm kind of uh, entering uh, maybe what I don't want to admit is, is what they call middle age. And so uh, sometimes uh, being middle age gets, uh, gets a bad play. People talk down to it, uh, but there's some, some cool things to it too. One of the things that I've appreciated uh, most recently, one of the hobbies that I've found that you can do when you're, when you're middle aged is uh, I've, I've enjoyed watching movies that I grew up on with my kids now. Uh, so I, I, I remember watching these movies when I was their age, and now we get to watch them together. And so I'm, I'm not going to tell you the list of movies that we've been watching, because my guess is you would judge my parenting and not like me very much. But I will, I will tell you one of the movies uh, that, that we've watched together that I grew up on. Uh, and the, the movie is this. It's a, it's a movie uh, called The Princess Bride. Maybe, maybe you've heard of it. It's a cinematic masterpiece. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Just trust me, all right? Uh, there's, there's the movie poster. Uh, it looks pretty epic. Right, it's a, it's a movie called The Princess Bride. Uh, it actually uh, it's a, it's an awesome story. I'll give you the, the plot here. According to IMDb, it says this. It tells the story of a swashbuckling farmhand named Wesley, accompanied by companions befriended along the way, who must rescue his true love, Princess Buttercup, from the evil Prince Humperdinck. Right? I mean, if you don't hear that sentence and want to see that movie, I don't know what's wrong with you. But that is the plot of The Princess Bride. And what I love about The Princess Bride, like I said, is it just has all these characters that you meet along the way. One of the characters is played by 1980s professional wrestling legend Andre the Giant, which means that it's a quality film. If you've got a professional wrestler in that, just write that down as a general life rule. Uh, maybe, okay, maybe not, maybe not. And Andre the Giant's not important today, but one of the characters, uh, I want to I just highlight real quick, he's one of the most entertaining people in this movie, and, and he is this guy, we'll, we'll throw him up here on the screen, but his name is Inigo Montoya. 
That's a pretty hardcore name, right? Inigo Montoya. And he's a, he's a Spanish fencing master who's always, throughout this movie, he's looking for revenge. He's looking for the six-fingered man who, who killed his dad. And, and this guy goes through a lot of different things. In the beginning, he's a bad guy. At the end, he's kind of a good guy. But he, no matter where he is, he's always saying these same four things. And it might sound weird, but the movie's kind of built on this. This is what Inigo Montoya says. These are his four statements. He only has four statements. Here they are. Buckle up. He says this. Hello. That's a pretty good statement, right? My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And as he's going throughout this movie, he's looking for the person who kills his father. He's, he's always saying this line. He's saying, when I meet the guy, I'm going to say this line. He's preparing. And everything about this character is built around these four statements. In fact, I, I recently saw a meme that, that was made of him. And they just said, it says this. It says, how to win friends and influence people, right? And it talks about this. You have a polite greeting. Hello. You say your name. My name is Inigo Montoya. You have a relevant personal link to the person. You killed my father. That's not super relevant unless that's true. But, and then the last one there, manage expectations. That's, that's a little weird. But, but uh, anyway, I, I show that to, to let you know this guy is known for these four statements. And that's kind of well, what he's always talking about, who he is and, and what he does. And that's what he says. And I'm not going to ruin the movie for you, so I'll just stop at, at that. But I, I love that there are statements sometimes that can, can just define who we are and, and where we've been and, and what's going on, right? I mean, we got to just hear from, from two people who were sharing their story, sharing what Jesus had done in their life. I know that, that Charlie has, has had a, a tough year for someone her age. I mean, she, she shared that, that she's felt numb in the past and, and losing her mom, and yet she shared that her, her stepmom has been able to come alongside her and show her what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. And so there's some statements that she said when she was up here that are frozen in my mind where I just think, yes, that captures what, what's going on in her life and what God is doing. And as Hunter shared his story, I mean, when, when someone has the the courage to get up in front of a group of people and just say, hey, I I didn't have a good relationship with with alcohol. But when they can also say, but that pushed me to start a relationship with Jesus, to strengthen my relationship with Jesus, right? There there were phrases in their stories that you can latch onto and you can hear that and you can say, all right, I, I see where that is going. Well, it's, it's Easter morning, right? We're, we're here to, to celebrate Jesus. We're here to celebrate new life and transformation in Jesus. We're here to celebrate that Jesus wasn't just put to death, but that he defeated sin and death. He was raised from the dead and, and gave us new life. And as we talk about the story of Jesus, as we talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, would you believe there's a passage in Scripture... It basically boils the Easter story down to, to four statements. Now, I'm not going to say the word swashbuckling as I, as I read this passage out of the Bible, and it's, it's not going to involve pirates or anything, but I think it's a, a pretty cool story and, and kind of boils down everything that, that we know and, and talk about with Easter, everything that we need to know for the Easter story into four statements. And so if you've got a Bible, I'd love for you to turn that Bible to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Verse 1, it's on page 598 if you've got one of the Bibles that's under your chair, around your seat there. And as you, as you turn there to Matthew 28, 1 on, on page 598, let me give you some background to this story. Because we know that Easter is about Jesus. Many of us know that Easter is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But before we read this passage that takes place at the resurrection of Jesus, let me give you the background and the context. And it's this, the week leading up to the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was a jam-packed week week. It was an intense week. On Monday of that week, Jesus went to the temple, turned over some tables of corrupt money changers and merchants, and and started to to kind of raise a a stink. And so some of the religious people in, in Jerusalem started to look at him and not like him. And on Thursday night, Jesus gathered with his closest followers in an upstairs room to eat the Passover meal one final time. And he instituted something new that we call the Lord's Supper. One of his disciples had already decided that he was going to betray Jesus, and so he slipped out of the room in order to carry that out and was given 30 pieces of silver by the chief priest so that he could hand Jesus over to the authorities. And So just after that last supper, Jesus took his closest followers, knowing that his death was around the corner, and he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and and he prayed, and he was in deep anguish, and we're told that he understood the weight of taking on our sins so much that he was sweating blood. Jesus was intensely praying and trying to lean on God and give this moment to God and his disciples were sleeping and and yet through his prayer he was strengthened and so as Jesus finished that time of prayer, the people who were going to come and and take him, this this mob uh, along with his disciple Judas came and and got him and in the wee hours of that evening Jesus was kind of put through what's known as a illegal nighttime trial where he was already 
up against a predetermined outcome and Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman ruler of that day, basically said, listen, I, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to sentence you to, to death. And so Jesus, having gone through this illegal trial, was stripped and flogged mercilessly by soldiers. They took turns punching him and spitting on him and mocking him. And they led him to this place called Golgotha, an infamous execution site. And he was crucified on a cross between two criminals. And even on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And shortly before the beginning of the Sabbath and the sunset on Friday, some Roman soldiers overseeing the crucifixion realized that Jesus was was dead. Sometimes death by crucifixion was so miserable it would take days, but what Jesus had gone through had taken his life. And so the soldiers removed his body from the cross and at the orders of Pilate released it to this man named Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph wrapped Jesus' body in linen cloth and placed it in a new tomb and sealed that, that spot with a rock. And the following day, Pilate, at the request of the Jewish leaders, sent soldiers and other Roman officials over to guard this tomb because they feared the followers of Jesus could come and steal the body and tell everyone that he had risen from the dead. And so that's the buildup. That's the week before. That's what's taken place in this story. That's how Jesus came to be crucified and give his life for our sins. And that brings us to where we are right here. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Follow along with me. Page 598, it says this. Early on Sunday morning... As the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear as they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid, go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. There's four statements that the angel made in this interaction at the tomb and those statements are are this, don't be afraid, he isn't here, come see, go quickly and tell. Four statements that kind of tell us everything that had been building up in the life, ministry, death, burial of of Jesus, everything that had happened in those chapters before, everything that's explained and told in the Gospels. And it starts with this phrase, this phrase, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. These women who had been friends and, and, and hung out with Jesus and part of uh, his, his, his crew were, were going to be at his grave. They were going to honor him. And, and you probably have to ask, is it, is it normal to watch your friend be put to death and, and to encounter an angel when you go and visit their grave? No, that is not normal. So there's a practical side to what the angel is saying here when he says, don't be afraid. Because even he probably realized that showing up on the scene like this is a, is a little weird. It's, it's probably similar to if you've ever been in a car accident and you have to car, call and tell your parents or tell your family members or tell someone. And you, the first thing you say is, don't be worried, I'm okay. And then you say you were in a car accident, right? Then you explain to them what's going to happen. You're trying to, to, to calm down their expectations. And so the angel is, is calming the mood practically. But what he's also saying is bigger than that. He's saying, listen, what you're about to see and feel and process and experience, it's probably going to freak you out. It's probably going to seem crazy. You might be intimidated by this. You might be threatened by this. But I want you to know, don't be afraid. I think sometimes when we're interacting with Jesus, when we're interacting and face to face with the love of God, we, we get this, this fear that comes over us almost and, and we don't really understand. My belief is there's someone here today that, that maybe came to, to see a baptism or you came because a neighbor or a friend invited you and, and you're not really sure what's going on. You feel something in this room and you feel different. And I think Jesus is speaking to us when he says, don't be afraid. Because what you're experiencing, what they were experiencing in this moment, what he's telling them they're going to see and know and experience is perfect love. And perfect love casts out fear. 
When we have an encounter with perfect love, we have nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be worried about. Perfect love eliminates fear. And so this angel is saying that the reality of the resurrection, everything that you're going to find out from here on out should bring joy, not fear. Do not fear. Let this moment bring you joy. When you're afraid, you need to remember what you're about to see. Remember this empty tomb. Remember that because of this empty tomb, you belong to Jesus. And from here on out, anyone who interacts with this moment, anyone who hears about this moment, anyone who sees this moment in this passage of scripture, anyone who listens to this story is going to know that they're encountering perfect love. So don't be afraid, the angel says. He goes on to say, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. In his second statement, he isn't here. You kind of kind of feel bad for these, these, these women that are visiting this tomb, right? Because something that's kind of crazy happens and the angel's like, hey, don't be afraid. And if I were there, I'd be embarrassed because I would be very afraid, right? And then they're doing the logical thing of thinking we watched our friend be put to death. We know that they took his body. We know that they put him in this tomb. And, and so they're just doing what you would logically do if you were looking for your friend and wanting to honor your friend. And yet they find out that they're already wrong again. This angel says, your friend that you're looking for isn't here. He's not here. His body's not here. He's not in the place you thought he would be. The angel's saying, listen, I've, I've got news for you. What you thought was going to take place is not what's taking place. Jesus is not dead. He's not to be looked for amongst the dead because he's alive and he's with his people. The resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Just as Jesus promised He's alive. Just as Jesus promised, we can be confident that he will accomplish everything he says in our lives. And his bodily resurrection shows us that he's alive. And he's the ruler of God's kingdom. He wasn't some false prophet making false promises. Jesus is alive. Death is not the end. There's future life. And when we're found in him, when we're surrendered to him, there's future life for us. And so the power that brought Jesus back to life is available to us when we're in a relationship with Jesus. It brings us metaphorically and spiritually, literally back to life in Jesus. Jesus is more than just some human leader, some person that was a wise teacher, some guy that was telling stories. He's the son of God and he delivered on what he said he was going to do. And that stone was rolled away so that people could interact with Jesus. That stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could, could get out. That stone was rolled away so that his followers could get in, so that they could see that he had given them life, so that they could see that he had defeated sin and death. People could, could walk into that tomb and see that he wasn't there because he was alive. He's risen from the dead just as he said would happen. The third statement is this, come and see where his body was lying. These, these women walked in this tomb and they could see for themselves that he wasn't there. They could see that the tomb was empty then, that it's, it's empty today. They could see that the resurrection was a historical fact. And I think sometimes we, we overlook that. We forget that, that our entire culture, our entire calendar is built on that fact. We have these, these letters, right? We say BC before Christ and yet we, we move forward since he came and lived his life on earth, since he gave his life, since he was put to death and since he resurrected from the dead for us. Time counts forward from that moment because that moment changed everything. And so I think we'd have to ask, if, if Jesus is alive, if Jesus isn't there, if he's not in the tomb, what does that mean for us? What can we put on that? Well, every person who's ever lived their life has done something that's insulting to God. In some way, they've sinned against God. In some way, we think that we know better than God. And the price of that sin, the penalty of that sin, is separation from God and, and death. We should expect death. But Jesus went to the cross. Jesus went to the grave because of his love for us. In fact, Scripture says Jesus shows his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And the death penalty that we should have paid, the, the price that we should have been up against was paid for by the death of Jesus Christ. But he didn't stay in that tomb. He's not still in that tomb. His death penalty was defeated. His resurrection defeated sin and that penalty once and for all. And Jesus did as he said he would do. Jesus came and delivered on God's plan and Jesus defeated the penalty for our sin. And so as these people step in the tomb, as these women stepped in the tomb, they were, they were, they were told, come and see, come and experience, come and know, 
Come and, come and taste what Jesus has done, what he's made available for you. You're no longer drugged down by your sin. You're no longer separated from God. When you trust in what Jesus did and you trust in the fact that he paid the price for you, you can rest in Jesus. You can know Jesus. You can have a relationship with Jesus. And verse seven, and now go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember, I've told you. I think some of us go through Easter every year and we think like, all right, we're going to sing this song and we're going to do this. And then I'm going to take a picture in the photo booth. And then I got to get to my mother-in-law's house. And I've got some things I do on Easter and I got to make sure I don't get barbecue sauce on my new pastel shirt or my wife will be mad at me. And we, we know what Easter looks and, and feels like and what we're supposed to do on Easter. And yet I think we miss this part. Go quickly and tell. Some of us have known that the tomb is empty for five years, for, for 10 years, for 20 years. And we would say, yeah, I understand that the, the tomb is empty. I understand that that's a big deal. I understand that the resurrection changes things. I understand that Jesus paid the price for my sin and defeated sin and death. And now in the same way that he's alive, he passes that life onto me and I'm spiritually alive in him. I, I get it. But I don't know if we, if we really get it because when we understand that, when our life is built on that, when we fathom that, when we know that, we're supposed to go quickly and tell somebody. We're supposed to pass on that truth, pass on that news. And if someone saved your life, my guess is you would tell somebody. If someone gave their life for you and changed your future, if someone defeated sin and death and paid the price for you, you would tell somebody. If you went to Chipotle this afternoon and someone paid your bill, you would tell somebody, right? That's a big deal. Imagine if someone saved you from eternal separation from God. From, 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 from God. What if someone saved your life and paid the penalty for your sin? We're told that we should tell somebody. See, these four statements, don't be afraid. He isn't here. Come see and go quickly and tell. These four statements lead to one answer. Jesus is the answer. These four statements are pointing to the, the questions that we don't even know that we're asking. They're saying, Jesus is the answer. No matter the question, no matter the circumstance, no matter the obstacle, no matter the doubt, no matter the fear, Jesus is the answer. Whether you know you're separated from God or not, Jesus is the answer. Whether you understand the weight of your sin or you even want to stop sinning, Jesus is the answer. Whether you're running from God or kind of thinking about God or you've been sort of thinking about spiritual things, Jesus is the answer. And sometimes we don't even know what we're going through. Sometimes we don't even want to admit the weight that we carry. Sometimes we don't even fathom what God is doing in our lives, and yet Jesus is the answer. See, some of us are, are asking questions, but, but we don't realize we're asking questions. They're in the back of our mind and we're trying to process them, but we don't want to admit that we can't do it or that we're not enough. And so we try to carry the weight of our sin and we try to carry the weight of our lives and we try to carry the weight of our failure. And in our quiet moments, in our private moments, we know that we can't be enough. We know that we can't do enough. And so hearing that someone else was enough, that someone did that for us, knowing that Jesus gave his life, the question that we're really asking when we look at Jesus in our, in our private moments, we're really asking, can I trust you? Can I trust you? And don't be afraid is, is more than just, hey, don't freak out. You're about to encounter Jesus. It's saying, yes, what you're about to see and know and experience, yes, you can, you can trust that Jesus. And some of us think like, well, what if I, what if I feel numb? What if I feel separated from God? What if I feel like I'm, I'm not good enough? What if I feel dead on the inside? I love that, that Charlie said that, that she felt numb before Jesus. What if we feel numb? What if we don't know what the answer is? The angel said he isn't here. And what he meant by that is he's alive. He's no longer in the grave because he's alive. And so if you feel numb, that's okay. Jesus is going to bring you to life. If you feel dead on the inside, that's okay because Jesus is going to bring you to life. If you feel separated from God, that's the truth. But Jesus is going to close that gap and give you a relationship and let you experience God's love. Some of us are thinking like, well, 
good because something needs to change. Something needs to change in my life, in my heart. I I need something to to look different. I need to experience a, a transformation because the things that I've been experiencing have left me feeling empty and confused and, and restless. And, and when this angel said, come and see, he was saying, come and experience, come and know, come and trust that Jesus loves you. Some of us think, well, now, now what? Go, go quickly and tell. Go and tell the world. If you know the love of Jesus, if you've surrendered to the love of Jesus, if, if your life is given to the love of Jesus and you have a relationship with him, tell the world. Jesus is the response to every fear, every trial, every obstacle. Jesus is the answer to everything. There's a song I, I used to love when I was growing up, a song called Rest Easy. There's a, there's a verse in scripture where Jesus says, listen, as you try to live life on your own and you try to be enough and do enough, it's, it's going to weigh you down. And eventually you're going to realize that you're not enough, that you can't do enough, that you're, you're a sinner, you're weighed down by sin, and you're going to look at Jesus and say, I, I, I need him to be enough. And this song, Rest Easy, said this, it says, as we cry out to Jesus, Jesus is saying, I'll take your burdens You take my grace, rest easy in my embrace. And so at the end of ourselves, in our defeat, in our sin, in our death, in our separation from God, we can look at Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you. I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you and I want to surrender my life to you. I'm not enough and I'll never be enough and I'll never get it right, but you're enough and you were enough and you defeated sin, you defeated death did all those things on the cross for me and I want to build my life on that I want to know you Jesus offers us a relationship with him he offers to let us rest in his embrace he offers to make us whole he offers to make us complete he offers us eternal life in the moment that we let go of ourselves and we let go of our life and we let go of our pursuits and we let go of our sins and we let go of the weight and the things that have been pulling us down and we just say, Jesus, I trust you. I want to rest in you. When we've been walking away from him and walking toward our own things and we turn and we say, I'm not going to walk away from God anymore. I'm going to turn toward him. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, I can know him. Easter's a a big deal because we're celebrating that death is defeated, that our sin is no more when we trust in Jesus and that we can know him. And whatever whatever question you're up against today, I don't don't know every person, I don't know every story in this room. Some of us, we're up against loneliness. Some of us are up against unemployment. Some of us are up against relationships that are struggling. Maybe you're going through a divorce or things just haven't been great at work. Some of us are up against depression. Some of us are up against some difficult, difficult things. And Jesus is saying, I gave my life for that. I want to help you defeat that. I want to help you get through that. I want to walk with you through that. And he's holding out his hand and he's he's offering a relationship. He's saying, will you trust me? Will you rest easy in what I've done and in who I am? Will you rest easy? easy in my embrace those four statements tell us everything we need to know those four statements tell us what we can build our lives on those four statements tell us that Jesus defeated sin and death and wants to know us and yes we're here in our pretty pastel clothes yes we're here and there's a photo booth and yes we're going to go to our parents house later and have a party Easter is not about those things. Easter is about Jesus defeating sin and death and wanting to know us, wanting us to experience his love, wanting us to have a relationship with him so that we can rest in him. Let me pray. God, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you love us in spite of ourselves. 
Lord, I thank you that even just for these brief moments, we get to stop and, and celebrate the, the story of Easter and celebrate the story that you wove through time and, and the characters that you used and the way that you chose to show us that you love us. You sent your son for us and you paid the price for our sin and you defeated sin and death so that we could know you and rest in you and be with you for eternity. God, I pray as we sing, I pray as there are people in this room thinking through a lot of things and realizing they can't do it on their own, that they're at the end of themselves. Lord, I pray that you will move in our hearts, move in our minds and bring, bring people to a place where they realize they just want to know you. They just want to rest in you. They just want to walk with you. They just want to have a relationship with you. God, give us, give us the courage to surrender to you Give us the courage to walk with you. Help us to respond to your goodness. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.